it's not often that we, that I please get a chance to introduce a, a scholar and a gentleman and a dear friend. So it's <laughs> one of those rare times when I have that privilege and the pleasure. So it's my absolute honor to welcome Matt McAllister. Uh, he was here <laughs> a few years ago, four years ago. And so it's a delight to have Matt back on campus. Um, several of you uh, know Matt, uh, many of you have heard of Matt. Uh, Matt is an attractive renowned scholar in his areas, uh, which pretty much pertain to um, advertising criticism, popular culture, and the political economy of media. And Matt's record is just stupendous. He has just so many books looking at many different aspects of advertising and popular culture, um, many popular readers, and also uh, a very acclaimed book on uh, the commercialization of American culture. Um, so in addition to all these books, uh, Matt has also published extensively in some of the most uh, uh, popular journals in our field, including Journal of Communication, Mass Common Society, Journal of Broadcasting and Electronic Media, Critical Studies in Media Communication, the list is just quite endless. Um, and not surprisingly, he's, you know, when you look at his list of his press appearances, the number of times he's been quoted in the press, uh, so it's, you know, it's almost as extensive as James and Mary Betts and uh, not yours. true. <laughs> not true. It's, 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 a, it's a great record. So uh, again, not surprisingly, it just serves on so many editorial boards and is also served as associate editor uh, of some of the journals in the past too. Uh, but that being said, also I have to say that uh, Matt is a ma master teacher. Uh, now several of you here have taken class with Mary Beth. Uh, Mary Beth tells me that Matt is absolutely the best teacher that she's ever seen. And well, you know, we have to look at it in terms of some empirical evidence here, and part of the empirical <laughs> evidence is he's won just about every major teaching award at every place he's been. So he was at Virginia Tech, he won the top university award there. He's at Penn State, he's garnered that award. It goes beyond that too, he's won the top teaching award given by NCA. So today he's going to be talking to us about some of his work on hyper-commercialized sports media and gender ideology. And that being said, welcome to Chapel Hill. Thanks, Shree. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, so is, the, is this working? Do I need to turn it on? It's good? You don't need that. I don't? <laughs> well, I think they need it for the recording thing, so, right. Well, thanks, everybody. First of all, it's a real pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. Uh, as Shri said, I've been here before. It was a great time, and uh, uh, your program is, of course, so well-known and renowned, and I really appreciate being included in it, so thank you so much. It's great. Um, so what I was going to talk about today is... Um, just some work that uh, I, I've done with um, one of the PhD students, Chindrai Kumanika. We had Betsy Graves speak to us um, a little while ago, and she, I, I'm stealing this idea of putting the picture of the co-authors on the slide. So that's, that's Chindrai right there. <laughs> uh, and um, this piece is um, going to be, in, it was, we, we're going to present it at ICA, uh, but it's also forthcoming in a book I've co-edited with Emily West, and there she is at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, in um, uh, a book of, that's kind of an overview book of what we see as critical and cultural approaches to advertising and promotional culture. And so this is uh, my and Chindrai's uh, contribution to that. And you'll, you'll see just some, noting some trends that we see happening uh, in sports culture and commercial culture. And we'll, so we'll talk more about that. Overall, uh, and this, as Sri said, this is part of the kind of work I do. What I look at in a lot of my research is um, focusing on the cultural and ideological implications of what I consider to be hyper-commercialized media forms. And I take this term from Robert McChesney, who's used it several times, including rich, rich media, poor democracy. Just the idea that there are, there's advertising forms that uh, go beyond what are the traditional contained advertising forms in our society, like the 30-second spot or the one-page uh, advertisement that we see commercial forms bleeding over or invading, or to use Lawrence Wenner's term, getting dirty with other media forms. So it would, be, it would, think, it would include things like license-based children's media. So if I don't know if anybody was here. I know, well, a couple of people were here. Last time when I talked about Bratz, uh, my previous presentation was on Bratz uh, dolls and Bratz media. Um, and so this would be an example of, again, I, I think of where advertising and promotional culture starts to kind of transcend uh, traditional forms. And so I wrote a piece recently with another graduate student, Zach Roman, uh, that looked at um, uh, The Brave and the Bold, which is a Batman cartoon that airs on the Cartoon Network, as especially licensing-based and promotionally oriented form of children's culture. Uh, I've done some work on product placement uh, with yet another uh, PhD student, Alex Nutter-Smith, 
uh, where we looked at um, elements where there was product integration on television shows, especially when partnered with uh, commercials for that product in the same text as you see the product placement. Uh, so this is an example. I don't know if anybody recalls this, the first season of 30 Rock, uh, where they had a parody, but not really a parody, of a Snapple product placement, where the, the characters very self-reflexively gushed about uh, Snapple, including Sherry, I think her name is, the character's name, 30 Rock people. Uh, and then lately I've done some work with sports sponsorship. Again, how uh, advertising, I would say, invades or intrudes, or again, in, in Winter's term, gets dirty um, sports broadcasting. And so there's a piece I wrote about that. I don't know quite how to do this with the mouse, so I'll have to... This is for all the Tostitos. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? Could you hear that? Okay. Tostitos, yeah. And does everybody know what this moment was? This was the Cam Newton. Yep, yep. And do you remember what that particular moment was? Oh, this is where we win the national championship. Right. That's right, exactly. Oh, we? Are you? All right. <laughs> wow. I did that just for you. <laughs> right, so obviously just, I, don't, I didn't write about that game in particular. I've, I've written about other national championships and the kind of commercial intrusion in that national championships. But that moment by Brenton Musburger was just too good to pass up, right? Where he, the, like the, in some ways, the key moment of the entire football season, he makes a joke about the sponsor, right, uh, during that moment. All right, so this particular project that I want to talk about today, it uh, really, what it does is combine three scholarly literatures. Uh, the first literature is a very extensive literature, and I'm just going to give you a real small piece of it. And I'm sure many of you have read or written about this kind of literature, gender representation in advertising. And, and that literature encompasses both the more critical cultural or qualitative interpretive areas, as well as the more social science areas, particularly in journals like Sex Roles, you know, publishes regularly about gender representation in advertising. Uh, also, the issue of gender representation in mediated sports, that mediated sports is a highly gendered space. So we'll, I'll review a little bit of that literature, but I'm connecting that up with this work on, the, again, hyper-commercialized forms, where you see advertising imperatives or advertising messages going over into what are traditionally seen as non-advertising forms, like sporting events or other cultural things that, again, we don't normally associate automatically as something that carries an advertising message. So really quick, and you know, I don't know about you, I mean, I'm one of these, it's, sometimes I get bogged down in the early literature review stuff, we don't have time for the good stuff, so I'm going to fly through this, and obviously if there's points that we want to, we can come back to later if I say something here that's provocative or, or you disagree with, or just something you want more elaboration on. Obviously there's a long tradition of work that looks at gender representation in advertising, um, arguing that advertising is a highly gendered um, cultural form, and, those, and there's work that specifically looks at images of women, for example, or femininity in advertising. And it you know, goes back at least to Irving Goffman, although Marshall McLuhan wrote about uh, images of gender in advertising in uh, The Mechanical Bride, some of you may know. Uh, and how women are systematically subordinated and sexualized. Judith Williamson has written about that in a very early piece of the semiotics of advertising. Uh, decoding advertisements from 1978, and of course many of you know Gene Kilborn's work, Still Killing Us Softly, and uh, that very series of videos, and some academic writing she's done. But that also, there's also work that looks at masculinity in advertising, and specifically though I'll argue that often advertising uh, portrays men in using the concept called hegemonic masculinity, uh, that uh, focuses on how mediated images of men uh, really emphasize traditional masculine roles, issues of violence, which is especially prominent actually in advertising, uh, nationalism associated with masculinity, and then the othering and punishing of other kinds of masculinities as a way to reinforce those traditional masculine images. So here's just, I mean, you could go to the internet and it takes like two seconds, right, to pull up images like this. So this is Captain America. Some of you may rec uh, rec recognize Chris somebody. Yeah, Chris Evans, right? And so, and uh, that's um, she was on True Blood as the Queen. No, um, Evan Rachel Wood. Yeah, that's her. Thank you. Yeah, Evan Rachel Wood. <laughs> and this is this would be the typical Gossman-esque subordination of women that that often occurs in advertising. It, it's cliche. The man um, 
positioned above the woman, the man looking directly at the camera, the man uh, gripping the woman while the woman caresses the man, right? These are typical Goffman-esque um, uh, systematic elements of how men are hierarchized above women. And some of you may know that Sajj Ali updated Goffman's um, analysis in a Media Education Foundation video that just came out a couple of years ago, where he argues it's just as prominent now as it was when Goffman originally wrote that book. Oh, right, the vulnerable throat, that's right, exactly, classic. Uh, then you uh, argue with that, or you combine with that, uh, gender representation in mediated sports. That is, sports is also a very highly gendered space. Uh, and obviously, it's, we, you know, it doesn't take a genius to see that it's a very masculine space. Um, that there's a very much a masculine orientation in mainstream sports and in uh, mediated sports. And this is just a list of the common things, but we could go on and on with this list. The lack of coverage of women's sports. Um, Michael Mesner has written a lot about this. For those of you who are uh, interested in sports literature, of course, he's a really prolific scholar in this. Uh, but it also includes uh, portrayals of women, including the sexualization of pro cheerleaders and sideline reporters, and in the masculine style of sports media like um, sports talk radio, which I'm going to talk much more about here. Um, and, you know, very confrontational, for example, very much an othering of, of uh, deviants. Then the last literature I'm combining is this literature on hyper-commercialized sports, which is what I've mostly written about directly before this project. That sports is, uh, uh, mediated sports is a very lucrative vehicle for advertising. Uh, that in 2011, $28 billion in ad spending on mediated sports. And that's just literally buying the ads. It doesn't account for a lot of below-the-line marketing activities that involve sports. Um, and you've also got um, sports advertising that links up very much, if, if probably even more so than the average ad, including with images of sexualized women and hegemonic masculinity, that sports ads are especially violent. Uh, studies that have been done of Super Bowl ads, for example, talk about the level of violence, usually violence combined with humor uh, in those kind of ads. Uh, and that often sports ads will portray intense male fandom that is over the top crazy behavior, you know, often associated with beer. Uh, and then the celebration of the regressive male. Uh, Mesner and Montez de Oca have this great article, I don't know if anybody's read it, called um, uh, The uh, Male Loser is Hero, and how in commercials you have these guys who are clearly losers, right? They're, they, they can't keep a job, they don't dress well, but, and, but they love beer. And in a way, it kind of, it, these ads reverse the traditional commodity fetishism. The traditional commodity fetishism of advertising is, you, use, you drink this beer because it'll get you women, if, you're, if it's a male audience. And these ads say, it's all about the beer and women just get in the way. You've got to get rid of women to drink the beer, right? So it's kind of a really disturbing message, even though it's framed humorously in these ads anyway. It's a great article if you're interested in kind of some new takes on how sports advertising works in terms of its gender ideology. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, like, it's like we give up. We know you love the product. It's no longer the product gets you other things. The product is its own thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, hyper-commercialized sports includes um, uh, inclusive, inclusive uh, commercial forms like the Super Bowl. And the reason I'm calling this a intrusive form is that you know, the super news coverage of the Super Bowl ad, uh, at least the last time I checked, is, is pretty expan expansive and may in fact be expanding in terms of covering the ads before the game, covering the ads after the game. You know, you turn on the morning talk shows the day after the Super Bowl, they all have a story about the Super Bowl ads, which ones worked and which ones didn't. So Super Bowl, the Super Bowl advertising has become a cultural event. We all know this. It's, again, it's not that much of an insight to point that out. And sports sponsorship. And we see this in the Olympics. We see this in college uh, football. Um, and many other uh, examples. I'm gonna, at the end, I'm going to show you some movement where this might be going. And so I'm defining sponsorship in this case as um, one sponsor or one advertiser or one brand attached to a sports text, and a text could be a lot of different things, including a televised event or a part of an event. So here, like this is from one of the national championship games a few years ago, where um, it was, again, Tostito sponsoring the game, but they can sponsor parts of the game, right? Including like the impact players of the game sponsored by Taco Bell, think outside the bun, okay? Um, and uh, that, when you look at sports sponsorship, that's another $12 billion spent in North America. So again, uh, these kind of intrusive forms where the whole point is to put the advertisement in these cultural forms, not just during a commercial, but like on the screen while the form is going on, is part of the attraction for advertisers. 
So, we have these trends then, right? Gendered spaces in advertising, gendered spaces in sports, and this kind of intrusive uh, movement of advertising into cultural forms, especially sports. And so the, the question I'm interested in with uh, this project that Chindra and I did, Chindra and I did, is a couple of questions we're asking. Um, is it that hyper-commercial sports forms only bring the consumerist ideology to sports? That is, is the main problem that you know, we have thinking about spending and Taco Bells and stuff like that while we should be concentrating on the game? Or given that advertising also brings other kinds of ideologies, like gender representation, does that get dragged into these cultural spaces like sports as the advertiser becomes a hyper-commercialized force, right? So does the gender ideology move with the advertising? And if it does move, what does that mean for the forms that it takes? You know, does the message get mitigated? Does it get exaggerated? Is it just it goes from one place to another? Those are the kind of questions I'm, I was interested in with this project. Um, make sense with me? Okay. So I, did, I looked at two case studies, one historical, Historical, it makes me feel old to say that, but it's true now, I guess. Um, now about 10 years old, a little less than 10 years old. This is the Coors Light Nightcap, which was a sponsored segment that aired on ESPN uh, during three football seasons. And then one from last year, uh, which was the Brute Slap sponsorship of the Jim Rome Show in 2011. In both cases, I would argue, gender imagery was dragged from a commercial form to a sports form. And actually, I'm going to argue that it was exaggerated in that movement, that it wasn't just it went from A to B, that it became a new thing, C, as it combined with already a gendered space with sports. Okay, so let's look at the Coors Light nightcap. <laughs> uh, so again, this was from the 2003-2005 season, and the campaign itself uh, that, that became part of the sponsorship activity uh, was a campaign that revolved around the Coors Light twins, and you'll see them in a second. Uh, and, and the Coors Light twin were two real, they were actually real biological twins. Adult women dressed as cheerleaders, very sexualized in the Coors Light advertising. And so the campaign itself uh, has images of intense male fandom, and including the role of beer in that fandom and things like tailgating, um, with sports violence, big hits, as you'll see. Uh, and what Laura Grindstaff and Emily West uh, would label an unreconstructed version of emphasized femininity. And they, they talk about that specifically, just as a real quick digression, because a lot of work now focuses on post-feminism, right? The issue of femininity being framed as a form of power, often with consumerism. So people like Susan Douglas has written by the, uh, about this and Angela McRobbie. But um, that doesn't mean that all images of femininity are post feminist, if that makes sense, that there are some that are like pre-feminist in a post-feminist world, if that kind of makes sense. And that's what these are. I mean, it, they're not really saying, oh, these women are empowered. They're just saying they're sexualized, yeah. right? For, the, for male pleasure. There's not a lot of reconstruction going on here, right? So let me show you an example. This, this is the ad. That, this is, there were like three or four ads in this campaign, and this is one of them. Okay, that's the ad. Now let's see the sponsored segment that was part of this campaign. So this is uh, from one, I think this is from a 2004 Sports Center. So uh, during the football season. So Sunday night, Sports Center, you know, would be after their NFL recap show. They would also recap football. And, and they would go to commercial, and they would come back to commercial. And this happened for three seasons for 17 weeks. Right, so 17 times three is how many times this aired, and then once it aired, it aired throughout the day because you know Sports Center re is rerun uh, insensibly on ESPN. 
And so here's a sponsored segment that was tied to that campaign. Okay, so you see what they did there, right? The, the way this routine would work, they would use the song that was associated with the Coors Light ad, and then they would re-edit highlights of the football uh, Sunday that happened that particular day. And they got the, the band to kind of record different versions, like the week 14 thing that it refers to. Uh, and obviously what the advertiser is interested in is emphasizing their brand image during this segment, right? That's the whole point of that. Yeah, yeah, that, that, was that was the segment. Yep, that was it. And then they just go on from there, right? They, they talk about something else. So um, let's, so some implications of this that I'm talking about is one is although sports is a gendered element and certainly Sports Center has, you know, shows elements of masculinity, in some ways you could argue Sports Center is a more progressive sports space than some other places. Um, so Michael Mesner has argued that SportsCenter, compared to other kind of sports recap shows, um, local and some other national, had actually less sexual voyeurism, and by that, you know, less cheerleader shots, right, um, than other sports media, but not with that segment, right? Uh, and is usually a space for female broadcasters. So Gail Gardner, some of you may know, uh, was one of the first national female sportscasters hired by SportsCenter, and then Linda Cohn later and others. Uh, and so you have, in other words, kind of a fairly progressive space that becomes not progressive during that two minutes um, that they air the um, uh, Coors Light nightcap. And you have the same images of intense male fandom, violence, nationalism, and of course sexualization. And one of the things Mesner argues, and he does, he's not talking about the segment, he was just talking about the commercials. Uh, that the segment was based on, that they tend to, un to reinforce for ESPN and other sportscasters what's called the cheerleader shot, usually aimed up, right, emphasizing their sexuality, because the commercials would have them. And, you know, one of the things advertisers want is for the programming to fit in with the commercials. Well, if that happens with just the commercials, obviously here we see literally the media form mimicking the uh, sexualized commercial style. And, in fact, I would argue worse, right, because... There's no twins in this, right? And of course, twins, we know, is code for sexual fantasy, right? Um, and in the course, twins, at least there is literally twins. Here, who becomes twins? All women. All women. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's generic cheerleaders who are not twins, uh, the same angles. So they're framed explicitly sexualized. Uh, and so it becomes this kind of generalization. So I would say it's worse, right? Because you could at least contain it as, well, they are twins, uh, but not in this segment, right? They have to force, they have to find shots to fit the lyrics that are sexualized because that's what the sponsor paid for, right? And interesting in this segment is that there's actually no product <laughs> shown, right? So it's all brand imagery. 
It would be like McDonald's ads that never show a hamburger. Uh, it's all about McDonald's being safe to your kids or a welcoming place or something like that. It's a similar thing here. In some ways, it's more intensely branding than the commercials are because of that. It's all about what is it that the beer is associated with, with just not the beer being there. Okay. Amazing. Questions? So, night, uh, so what is it, Sports Center actually does the editing, and that editing changes each time. So yes. That's amazing. And it's based on the, the day's events or whatever. That's correct, right. And almost always, uh, what, uh, the, the main thing this campaign got criticized for is the violence it emphasized. Because, of course, it's a rock score, and you're going to emphasize either the fans going, ah, or the, the occasional you know, coach losing on the sideline, but mostly the big hits, yeah. right? Uh, and it would be interesting now, it may be that the reason you wouldn't see something like this now is the NFL is kind of emphasizing the big hit thing with the concussions. Uh, but in 2003, 2005, big hits were a part of the brand of the NFL. So they liked this, uh, how football is portrayed here, right? And Matt, a quick question. Yeah. Did you look at also uh, the websites that are dedicated to this kind of thing? I did for that because it had already happened. Uh, I just had to catch this on various DVR recordings. But I did with the Jim Rome show, which we're going to talk about but next. Not with, not with ESPN, I didn't. Yeah, because it, they, by the time I started studying it, the, you know, that's one of the problems with the internet, it goes away. And so the, my texts had gone away. So yeah, so I don't know to what, my guess is, it very much accentuates some of the ideological trends I'm arguing were there. I, I doubt if it mitigated it. Uh, in fact, you'll see exactly that effect happening with this next case study, okay? The other thing that was interesting in that clip you showed was the patriotism. You oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that often a kind of hegemonic masculinity is associated with the nationalism or Americanism. Yeah, for sure. And it's a theme. And there's, there's a great piece by Michael Butterworth. I don't know if people have stumbled across this. And oh, I always get the two, the ICA and the NCAA journals mixed up that are both like critical, cultural, and I'm getting them mixed up, right? And that's my area. I should know these things. But in one of them, he, he writes about um, there was a football game, an end of season football bowl sponsored by a military contractor. Um, the like bell something, 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 and just essentially what they argue is a giant recruitment for the military, tying it football to military imagery and masculinity, images of masculinity. So for sure that's often associated with these hegemonic imagery. All right, the second example is in fact more about masculinity, although it doesn't completely, uh, I mean by, by negation in a way, it talks about femininity. Um, but in more direct ways, too. The, other, the second case study I want to see is, talk about is more recent. Uh, and this is the Jim Rome Show. And I don't know if people know the Jim Rome Show. It's a national talk radio show. It, it airs three hours every day. Uh, and, and it's syndicated throughout the country. And it stars Jim Rome. And Jim Rome is also a multimedia star. He used to have a show on ESPN. I think he just moved to a new sports network. Um, and he is um, th this very male, traditionally male um, uh, talk show guy. That is, he's very confrontational. He does a lot of put downs, right? He doesn't laugh a lot, or he's kind of seems very deadly serious, although the show has a kind of a humor. Uh, and so the Jim Rome show then is, is kind of gendered in this way, gendered in its style, very confrontational, a lot of inside lingo, uh, labels for him and for other kinds of trends. A lot of loyal fans who will call in uh, regularly or email or, or tweet. Um, and uh, although someone like Nyland, who's written extensively about the Jim Rohn show, emphasizes the traditional masculinity elements of it, they also recognize that sometimes Jim Rohn uh, would step out and maybe critique um, homophobia or things like that, you know, fairly conventional things he would critique. It wouldn't be a fundamental, you know, like arguing there's a gender performance you know, arguing for gender performance or something like that. But if somebody's been blatantly homophobic, he often would step out and critic, critique that sports moment. So it's not totally hegemonic, in other words, right? There's, there's some contradictions in the show. Uh, and specifically, what, I, what Chendra and I looked at is a sponsorship that started last year is uh, Brute sponsoring the Jim Rome show. And of course, Brute, you know, the cologne, right? Uh, as a long association with sports, Joe Namath um, and Hank Aaron 
were Brute spokespeople. But this specific campaign I'm looking at, and you can kind of see it here, this is the website, so here we go, is um, uh, the Brute, uh, Brute Slap campaign, where the main slogan was, some men just need to be slapped. And you'll see where we're going with this, the kind of man that needs to be slapped, you'll see. Um, so a press release for the Brute Slap campaign, here I, may, I was able to get again the integrated marketing stuff because the campaign was going on as we were doing our data collection. The, the press release kind of softens the campaign. It says, oh, this is humorous, creative execution, designed to celebrate the differences in everyone and being true to yourself. And by this they meant designed to punish those who are different from a traditional masculine hegemony, right? You can't really see that in those words, but that's what they meant, okay? Let me show you, here's a couple of just uh, ads, TV ads that went with this campaign. I'll show you two, they're both very short, but they're both so outrageous, frankly. Well, not more outrageous than twin cheerleaders, I guess, but still pretty outrageous. Hi, I'm Alex. You know, most people mistake me for European. I prefer wine to beer, and I spent $200 on this haircut from a slave to feng shui. You feel me? That's good stuff. Okay, here's the other one, I think. Not sure if I advance the slide. Let's see here now. Oh, I go oh yeah. Not because my wife makes me, but because my 18th century French mahogany wood and tiara would look just silly without the matching walnut or cocoa nightstand. Duh. They had to put that last part in in case you didn't get it, because it was too subtle for you. Is it a woman's hand? I think it's a man's hand. I've, I've looked at that, actually. I have looked at that. It's, I, it's probably the best answer is it's ambiguous. It's polysemic. <laughs> so no, it's, I have the same feeling. It seems like a woman's hand. I looked at, you know, I looked at it, and I zoomed in on it, and it, it's, at the very least, unclear. It could be either. I think it's, it's androgynous. <laughs> but, it, but I think so. You can interpret it either way. I don't know. I don't know. That might be up to the beholder, I guess. Both of them have ideological statements to them, whether it's a man or a woman. The campaign is aimed at men, just given where they placed these ads and the kind of things they sponsored. But maybe they want to say women will slap you if you, if you are not American, right? Some people mistake me for European. If you spend too much on your appearance, right? If you do... Um, things that are considered way overly creative or sensitive, like feng shui, right? Then you need to be slapped, right? You need a physical intervention, is what the campaign is saying, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the gist of the campaign. Here's, uh, again, just some other ways, that, uh, some other elements that they emphasize. Uh, this is from the Facebook page. Um, Facebook fans, th this is a game you could play on Facebook. Uh, we all know them. They're out wandering aimlessly in public. Some may carry a ridiculous little dog in a designer bag, or maybe they're in the gym spending more time looking the, in the mirror than working out. Somewhere along the way, these men have lost their essence. The only solution is to slap them back to their senses with brute. After all, brute is the essence of man. We've gathered nine candidates that are worthy of a slap. So here are the nine. And the game you could play is that it, it's called the brute slap symphonic slapification. Right, is that you can like, choose one of them to get slapped. Right? And so you've got all sorts of these imagery, some of them tied to race, right? like the hip hop guy, a Jersey Shore-esque person, somebody who uses face care, right? European, again, kind of a jingoistic thing going on. Right? But it's, in other words, we're disciplining non-traditional hegemonic masculinity, explicitly not American, got to be working class, got to be engaged in masculine activities, right? And if you're not, you literally need to be abused. This is kind of the campaign. So the sponsorship of the Drim Rome show included several things. And by the way, how much time do I have, Shri? What's, am I good? Okay. 
Uh, the sponsorship of the, of the Jim Rome show, uh, so this campaign sponsored the Jim Rome show, the radio show, right, the talk show. And it included a, a, um, some traditional things that were, I would consider hyper-commercialized forms because they included host selling. That is, Jim Rome himself reading the ads uh, during the broadcast of his own show. And that included pre-recorded spots, so they would, you know, this is the Jim Rome show, cut to commercial, and then it would be Jim Rome again reading the brute slap spot. Or before they go to commercial, during his show, Jim Rome would do a live read where he would pick up a, uh, uh, a manuscript and read, again, the brute slap copy. So here's an example of um, a pre-recorded spot on the Jim Rome show. So I know that's really small. I apologize, but I've got the audio here, I think. Yeah, there we go. Oh, wait, can I... Let me just say, I, I had to record this on my iPhone because um, later things, it's going to be a little, the other thing I'm going to show you is, is a lot easier to hear. It's because you can subscribe to the Jim Rome Show and then get the, the MP3s, download them. But it doesn't include the commercials, and I needed the commercials. So I would be listening to the Jim Rome Show with my iPhone. I'm going to go to a commercial spot, I'd turn on the iPhone, so I'd record it, right? And then this is what this is. <laughs> so it doesn't sound too good, in other words. Sorry about that. We've got a brand new sponsor to kick off 2011 with, and I am bonked. I am going old school with it. Bruce Cologne. Yes, that is Bruce. Old school cool. Back in the day, Muhammad Ali, Rep. Bruce. So did Joe Namath. And what was cooler than Broadway Joe styling his pink coat and white cleats and shocking the world? So when Bruce came to me and said, We want you to pump our new message, let him know what it was. I said, Bring it on down. And then when I heard that message, I knew it was no brainer. Bruce is reminding all of us. Some men just need to be slapped. Yeah, I said that. That's how Brooke gets down. And not like you do it to demean somebody or you're looking to go. Not like that. To get somebody to man up or wake up or bring it. You know, the reaction most of us had when Longy, Jared, and Hutch talk the old gunslinger into coming back one more time. Like, come on, man, really? Good opens a full line of grooming products, cologne, deodorant, antiperspirant, and shaving gel. Brooke is everywhere. Twitter, TV, online, and Facebook.com. Okay, and and some of the live reads actually were even worse. And I, I don't I have it in the in the paper, but I, I didn't duplicate it. Where they you could argue, well, there's the there's the Joe Namath thing talking about you know wearing a mink coat, but all that even that stuff even got removed later. And it was all about we have the courage to slap men, right? It was all about kind of how it emphasizes your masculinity if you're the one who slaps. And, and this is very much like um, in the Jim Rome style, clones is a, is a Jim Rome word. Uh, it refers to a sports incident, but doesn't really explain it. Uh, people, anybody know what the little story they're telling here refers to? What that refers to? Anybody knows that? Who Longy, Jarrett, and Hutch are? It's, it's when the, the Minnesota Viking players went down to Louisiana to try to talk Brett Farb into coming back. And, and playing, it was kind of a debacle, and they had to beg him, and anyway, all that stuff. So they're making fun of that, right? He's referring to a recent sports thing. Here's an example of how the sponsorship gets integrated into the show. And it got into, integrated into the show in a few different ways. And by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess, I didn't listen to every Jim Rome show in 2011, which I, I would have needed to, to really get the whole thing. So I'm, I will admit I'm... I, I'm picking and choosing ones that I happen to find, because you can't do a full text search of the Jim Rome show. At least I don't know the software that's available to do that. Um, it would have made, anyway. made me crazy, yes. I would have, yes, been slapping myself <laughs> after a while. Uh, but, the one, but here's some ones I did find. And so uh, other ways this becomes hyper-commercialized, besides the host selling, is mentions of Brute in the show itself. So here's an example. Brand handled at tweets. Rome. Awesome interview yesterday with Charlie Andrews. More brute slapping a sponsorship sticker on Sir Charles jousting armor. I'll tell you what, I'll talk to Brute about that. I'll talk about it. They need money. They'll be in arenas. He says it's the next big thing. He said stadiums, not even arenas. Let me tell you something, they probably had Brute. Back then, Brute's old school were cool. They probably had Brute back in the 12th century. This is not an ad, right? No, this this is a segment. When the Jousters were tearing it up. 
Brute is so far ahead of his time. Brute is so far ahead of his time, he's probably had his showers. <laughs> now they had Brute back then, you're right though. These guys do need some decals. They need some signage. They need Brute. I'm gonna talk to my pals at Brute about that. Yeah man, Sir Charles get big. You get big at the end of the show. I love that song. I'm thinking about replacing Sorry, I cut this part I cut this part out. Sorry. Let me tell you something. Lady Guinevere loved it when her man slapped on some brew. <laughs> she was up in that tower. Dudes would fruit slap each other themselves. Try to get up there together. <laughs> tell you what, man, I thought about this. Jousting's cool. I, I, I should have set this up a little bit better. Oh, sorry, sorry. That's enough. We can't handle another one. <laughs> I should have set that up a little bit better. Um, that uh, there, he had a jouster on the on the show the, the day before, and in fact, some of you have seen. There's like jousting on cable now, right? There's some, yeah. There's some sports channel that airs jousting, Ex extreme jousting. Um, and so here, you know, obviously he's kind of having fun with it. He's, there, there's some humor here, but still it's associating Brute with, well, medieval, you know, gender relations, right? Getting the woman out of the tower, and, uh, you know, jousting people and Brute slapping and all that stuff, right? So um, here's an example of, again, how the show reinforces the style of the campaign and vice versa. Uh, but it, it's, it's almost like the sponsor gives them license to talk about these kind of gendered issues. And if it's true for him, it's also true for the callers. And you see a little hint of that, right, that this is started by a tweet. So you've got fans writing or calling to Jim Rome, referring to the campaign slogan and the ideology of the campaign slogan. Um, so another thing that the sponsorship included was uh, a sponsor of one of the specific episodes of the Jim Rome Show, the most famous episode every year called The Smack Off. And The Smack Off is where fans would call in. They're pre-screened. Not every fan can call in. You have to be selected to call in. And you talk trash about the other fans of the show, right? And, that's, and you, you're given like two minutes to talk trash, and then they choose at the end the winner of The Smack Off. And they do this every year. So it's a very confrontational, put-down-oriented, masculine thing. Right? And Brute sponsors this. Um, so it's by far the most confrontational day of the show a year. And so callers, participants that, that day, uh, and I've, I've included two of them, but there were a couple of others, integrated the language of Brute Slap into the slap off. Dan in DC just Brute Slapped Jeff in Richmond off the pedestal. That's Jim Rome's read of a listener's email. And then, and then one of the actual calls said, last year I came in, called my shot on Wednesday, Brute slapped everyone in the next week on Friday. Nobody had ever, um, nobody had, ever had the game or the gonads to try something like that, much less pull it off. So here we see the fans explicitly attaching Brute to this kind of masculinity, right? The, the idea of, you're, now you are Brute slapping a lot of different kinds of people, right? In, in this, the way they appropriate it. By the way, one thing I didn't talk about is obviously brute slap is semiotically tied to the term bitch slap, right? So it's already a gendered phrase to begin with. Then one thing I looked at was uh, the Jim Rome Facebook page uh, during all this, during the sponsorship, and looking at how fans posted about brute, if they did, maybe they didn't when I started looking at it, if they posted about brute, and here we see then a natural extension of combining the male aggression of the Jim Rome show with the explicit violence and disciplining function of what brute slap seems to apply. And here there's no humor. Right here it becomes explicitly gendered where when somebody hears somebody in the show they don't like, they talk about brute slap, right? In this very explicit way. So there was a, a, an incident where Marvin Lewis, who's the coach of the Cincinnati Bengals, was not getting along with Carson Palmer, who at that time was the quarterback of the Bengals. And one fan posted, boo hoo hoo, you sound like a couple of scorned teenage lovers, brute slap bitches. Or um, another posted, give this a hole a brute slap for all of us. And another posted, brute slap this tool. So here you have brute slap being added to other terms of degradation uh, that comes from the fans, again, right, is what we're seeing here. 
All right, so those are my two case studies. So let me just do some concluding thoughts about this. Um, so again, what I would argue is, what, what, really what I thought was going to happen is, well, we're going to see these sports spaces just use the ideology of this gendered advertisement in the sports space, right? But I don't think that's what's going on. I think, it, I think that the two gendered spaces collide to make it really worse. It, it accentuates the ideology of the, the commercial campaign. So it, it's not just reinforcing the ideology, it's an amplification of the ideology. Uh, so when Coors Light moves into Sports Center, all women become sexualized twins. When uh, Brute Slap moves into Jim Rome, it's not just Brute Slap these caricatures, but Brute Slap real people and you know, add a little extra derogatory labels to them, often femi from feminized or masculinized uh, assumptions. And I think this is going to keep happening. I think I'm just, we're just seeing the start of things like this. And I think it's going to, be, going to keep happening with the increasing niche media. People like Joe Turo talk about, and we see multiple uh, very niche-oriented cable channels or websites. Um, and marketers are looking to tie into those niche-oriented uh, media outlets as they look to uh, really nail down uh, specific consumer markets. Uh, and as we see more and more use of sports sponsorship, so I don't know if anybody saw, this is from uh, the New York, a headline in the New York Times this week. Uh, NBA takes a look at, jer at jersey sponsorship, not New Jersey, but sponsorship on the jersey, <laughs> right, on the basketball jersey. So already we're seeing pro sports really looking more seriously at uh, sponsorship activities and I think therefore increasing this uh, gender dynamic that I've seen go on. Should I show you a couple more examples or are we done? Are you sick of it? Are you, do you have two quick, uh, these are bad, I'm apologizing in advance, right? In some ways I give you the, like, the, I give you the fairly sensitive ones, okay? Here's another example. And again, this, and you know what? These tend to be hidden from most of us, right? Part of the reason I get away with this is that People don't see this unless you're already inculcated into that mindset because they're hiding it within niche marketing, right? They're hard, hiding it with the specialized outlets. So one example of this is Hooters, which is the restaurant chain, but it is a giant media brand, right? There's all sorts of Hooters uh, specials and magazines and calendars, and they do a lot of sports sponsorship. So here's an example of this very quick. I'm sorry. I mean, what do I, I'm not going to say anything. Let's just move on. One more example. Sorry. And this one is an example of not an actual sponsorship activity, but a commercial that combines the language of sponsorship with the language of, again, hegemonic masculinity. You get the idea, right? Again, it's classic hegemonic masculinity. You discipline alternative masculinities. Uh, in this case, they reject that. The only person that gets rejected from the sponsorship uh, is the European guy who shaves his chest, right? So it's very, this campaign aired last year, very similar sort of thing. All right. Oops, sorry. All right, obviously some uh, things that we can think about as scholars who write about these trends uh, is A, I think it's important to document and critique such trends, especially since they tend to get hidden in these kind of niche media outlets. Uh, and I, but on the other hand, I think they, they are gonna become more common. Um, to incorporate its criticism in our pedagogy, that is to talk about these issues in class, of course. Uh, and related to that, to encourage key demos to voice their dissent, 
So I can write Miller, I can write cores, I can write ESPN, but I'm a 51-year-old professor, <laughs> right? I, in, in three years, I am invisible to them. I'm done. But our students aren't, right? They are in the wheelhouse of these target markets. And so, and you know, um, a lot of our students, they are sensitive to gender issues. And some of it is, again, about making it visible and decontextualizing these examples from the natural settings of the couch football game, a little bit drunk setting that, that they intended us to see these ads in, right? To decontextualize them. Um, and obviously what we, what we have are several stakeholders that can be approached, including the advertisers, the sports teams and leagues themselves, and the media um, as a way to kind of, you know, voice our dissent uh, when we see this kind of activity. So, just want to thank uh, to everybody who made this possible. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. This is the first time I've given this presentation about this topic, so thank you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. If you go back to those beer, com the beer commercial, I wonder if the people putting together the commercial, sitting out of room and being creative, would. Um, do you suppose they have a mindset at all like yours? Or are they just thinking, we'll get this, we'll do this? They don't think about it in systematic terms and culture, do they? Would you think? Have you ever sat in on any of those creative sessions? Uh, I haven't. I've read some cultural work about advertising professionals. And I think, and people can correct me if anybody has that experience in here, can please add to that. I think that they are about selling the brand. I think they limit their their efforts to the instrumental nature of the purpose. I could be wrong. Now, now some, some people that have written about advertising work say that adver advertising creatives themselves, what they're most interested in is the creative, the creative moment. They know they have to sell the product, but they congratulate themselves when they do something creative. So what I would imagine their mindset of putting together the ESPN spot is picking the hits of the day of all that they can pick in ways that hit the beat, right? And this aesthetically, this aesthetic criterion they have, that's what I think, that's how they think they compartmentalize it. So they don't frame it in terms of cultural influence. They're not even aware of these things. So if you were to give your presentation to them, would they recognize it or be dumbfounded? They'll recognize the point, the point I'm making? I, you know how, I think Michael Schutzen in advertising, um, what's, it, what's, the, what's the word after, you know the famous book he wrote, advertising, its dubious impact on a culture is the last part, advertising, the uneasy persuasion. Uh, he says, and it's probably true, that advertisers have two drawers. When, when people say, does your advertising affect, does your advertising have effects? They have two drawers. And one drawer they open when it's, um, Congress asking them that, or advocacy groups, and they say no. Yeah. Our our research shows that people, you know, will bring their own mindsets to the ads. They'll they we won't affect them at all. And then the other drawer is when the clients ask, "Do ads have an effect?" And they say, "Oh yeah, we can see it improves product recognition, so and so, and it coheres the brand image around the entire effect." And anyway, and I think that's probably how they compartmentalize. And they might very well say. We're about selling the product. We, th we think that it helps sell the product. We think people shrug off all that other stuff. I think that's what they would say. But I tell you, you know, and maybe this is the experience with other people, when I have advertiser, like advertising majors in my classes, um, the, and, and many of them are women, and the issue of gender gets them worked up. So as students, they see this. Um, now, when they become freshers, I don't know. Yeah. I, say, I, I would say, I, I also just had a general question, but um, I teach video production here, mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you, it's, um, it's really easy, uh, well, for, for me too, but also for, for my students to put on completely different hats, and it seems mm, like right. they, the, those hats come with completely different brains. <laughs> and then so when they're, you know, when they're trying to you know, create something and it's supposed to be exciting and I, I would say we would probably, all of us, including me, be guilty of creating a video that would look very similar to that mm. because it would be looking for the compelling shots and you know something visually interesting. 
not thinking at all about what the implications would be or what the unintended effects would be until we were being asked to think critically. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But I think, yeah, if, if you're just thinking about getting the job done and you have a certain set of goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I mean, right. I, and I've seen, I've seen that. I've seen people actually you know, come up with things where it's like, wow, boyfriend in a box, did you actually think about what this is saying? You know? Right, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, good question. I don't know is the short answer to that. <laughs> uh, the more slightly more nuanced answer, I guess, is um, Michael Mesner. I, I cited one of his articles in this, and he argued that the Coors campaign before the sponsorship thing seemed to, when it when that started airing and became popular, seemed to encourage more cheerleader shots than before. But I think that was anecdotal on his part. I don't think he did a systematic content analysis of that sort of thing. My instinct is that whether they aired, those shots aired during the game, I sh I'm sure they had to have, they had to have collected them. Because otherwise the end twins makes no sense. What are you going to show? You know, the logic of the song is you got to show. That shot is, 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 is one of the, you know, like they have a check for right. stuff to do in, like, as they're bringing the... Going to commercial. To the, or, yeah, coming, going to commercial coming back. And that's one that they'll try to get at almost every college basketball game, every college football game. And, and it's less common because not all NFL teams actually have cheerleaders. But, right. But, but, but most of them do. And, and for, that is, uh, it's like a checklist shot. It's not all, uh, it, is, it is much more sexual um, at the, at the uh, pro, at the pro right. level. Uh, I, I think they, they show. The outfits. I've seen at, um, ESPN a, a little bit more of a concerted effort to, to not try to sexualize the younger. Um, but, but, but yeah, I, I, that, I think I can answer that question. Yes, that's, that's a shot. And it looks like to me they were just pulling footage that was, that was filmed from the network. So right. So that was just, you know, that had already aired and they were just re-airing what, you know, had already happened in the game footage. Mm -hmm. That's probably true. I, but I don't know for sure if it was A-roll or B-roll. That was my, I, I didn't know for sure that. But I I'm bet your, my money would be on what you said. Yeah. Speaking of A-roll and B-roll, I, I worked um, in uh, the promos department for Fox Sports for three years, and um, the way that you described the creative process was very true to, to my experience, but on top of that, we were all, always encouraged to get what was called C-roll, which was beautiful women, um, mm. you know, whether it was cheerleaders or fans. Mm. What, what did you call that? C-roll. <laughs> Yeah, which I'm not 100% sure what it represented, but I had some guesses. Um, but uh, so I thought, you know, just to, to weigh in on this production aspect of it. And um, one thing that I, I uh, one thing I'd be interested to hear um, your opinion on is the the fact that sports are live, right? And I feel like that to some extent contributes to that collision of the, um, especially nowadays when you can fast hmm. forward mm -hmm. through. Oh, right? I see. So, and do you know what I mean? So, so, mm -hmm. and there's almost this sort of excitation transfer, mm -hmm. I think that that is happening with the advertisements as well as the sporting event. Um, That's an interesting study idea right there. Right? <laughs> and, and so, so, you know, if you're watching an exciting TV show, there's sort of a buffer when you're fast forwarding through the, the commercials, but watching sports, it's very important to, to be there in the moment. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, so you're probably more attentive to some extent to the, to the commercials. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some form, I mean, obviously the Super Bowl, the commercials are part of the experience. Mm -hmm. where they, I mean, you know, the, I, the percentage of people that watch the Super Bowl just for the Super Bowl, again, last time I checked, I haven't checked it for a couple of years, is in, it increased every year for about four or five years, for sure. And maybe it's continued to increase. So there's that. And, but the issue of the liveness is that 
Therefore, that's encouraged sponsorship forms, you're saying, or uh, it's encouraged more of a sexualization of it to heighten the effect, or? I mean, yeah, that's what I would think. Okay. Because, you know, that, that added violence and that added, uh, that hypersexualization, you know, would likely kind of, you know, provide that excitation transfer. Right, right, interesting. It could be right. You know, one, one thing, uh, um, you know, about the production culture, too, so the, the next study I'm going to do with a, another graduate student, another PhD student, Lauren de Carvajo, is we're going to look at, um, I guess this is glutton for punishment territory. Uh, we're going to look at Victoria's Secrets and Hooters, but essentially Victoria's Secrets. And like the integrated marketing of the Victoria's Secrets fashion show. And not just look at the fashion show itself, but you know that the Today Show, uh, not Today Show, CBS Early Show, has a, usually will have a segment about the Victoria's Secret fashion show that day, and I've recorded the last several times, and you can get it on LexisNexis and stuff, and the gender dynamic of the reporters, the news workers, when they have to do this is really telling, where um, the men play this, you know, like tongue wagging role, and the women are pretty explicitly disgusted by the whole thing, and they'll, they will force, they will say things like, well, essentially we're forced to do this segment. And so there'll be this kind of counter hegemony that goes through, but it's almost always the women, the women reporters, the anchors that, you know, essentially are rolling their eyes at having to do this. Yeah, sorry. I know, I know. And uh, so easily transferred to slapping women right. as well. And yeah. so that should, have, that should have had a public outcry. That's just horrible. Mm -hmm. Was there nothing like that? I think they hit it. No, I, I'm going to say I haven't, um, you know, all this happened in the summer, and we, we had to write the paper at the beginning of the summer, and I didn't go back and recheck. So maybe if I did a new search now, or, or just an internet search, a Google search, I would find those kind of things. So it could be it's out there and I haven't found it. That, that I, I look, we, did, we wrote this too early, and now I need to go back and re-look. So it could be that it's out there. But part of me, I think, is, again, you can hide stuff like this in niche media. Yeah. And I think that's what they did.